I'm Margaret Brennan in Washington, and this week on Face the Nation, our CBS News polling shows new gains for Vice President Harris. But what about in those all-important battleground states? With six weeks to go until Election Day, voting is already underway in a handful of states, and both sides are encouraging supporters to get out and vote. Take nothing for granted. You have to get out and vote. The election is basically here, and we have work to do to energize, to organize, and to mobilize. But growing concerns of foreign interference in our elections continue to loom over both campaigns. We'll ask the top Republican on the Senate Intelligence Committee, Florida's Senator Marco Rubio, about it. We'll also talk with an ally of Vice President Harris, Colorado's governor, Jared Polis. Then, after a second assassination attempt on former President Trump at his golf club in Florida, the scrutiny of the Secret Service intensifies. We'll talk to one of the Democrats on the Congressional Task Force investigating both cases, Pennsylvania's Chrissy Houlihan. Plus, escalating exchanges of fire between Hezbollah and Israel just days after Israel carried out a daring attack on Hezbollah by detonating thousands of pagers and walkie-talkies. Is the risk of wider war in the Middle East growing? The president of Israel, Isaac Herzog, will join us. It's all just ahead on Face the Nation. Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. We begin today on the presidential race in our new CBS News poll, which finds Vice President Harris up four points nationwide over former President Donald Trump. With interest rates and gas prices on the decline, she's aided in part by some improvement in views of the economy. Across the battleground states that will likely decide this election, Harris is up by a slimmer margin of two points. So this remains a contest that either candidate can win. For more, we're joined now by our executive director of elections and surveys, Anthony Salvanto. Anthony, this is a remarkable national poll because to date, the economy has been viewed as a headwind for Democrats that appears to be shifting. Well, we saw a little bit of an uptick in voters' views of how the economy is doing. I should say right away, most people still think it's not good. But to the extent it moves in a positive direction, here's how it connects to votes for Harris. Number one, she wins votes of people who think the economy is getting better even if it's not good. She wins the voters who say that their own finances are doing okay. She wins the votes of people who think the economy itself is good. Now, maybe all that's not unexpected for anyone from an incumbent party. There's always been this kind of nature of the times dynamic here where people who say things are bad, Donald Trump has been benefiting from that, especially people who say inflation is a top concern. So net-net, Harris has cut in to Donald Trump's margin, still an advantage, among people who say that the economy is the top issue. Is she ever going to eclipse that? Maybe, maybe not. But the question politically is, can she do well enough to sustain this uh, sort of very slight edge mm -hmm. in what is, and I got to sort of reiterate this if I can, still a really close contest. Because even when you look state by state, yeah. everything is razor tight. It can go either way. So how much did the debate help? Well, a little bit in terms of firming up support for Harris in the sense that on net, voters told us it made them more likely to consider her as compared to Trump. But the people who said that had voted for Joe Biden in 2020. They were already sort of Democrats or liberals. So in the sense that she's still trying to kind of cement that Biden electorate from 2020, that helps. And I should add quickly, look, Donald Trump's support isn't going anywhere. The question for him is, can he draw more voters to him, which doesn't look like it's happening just yet. So immigration and the border crisis have been a prime area of attack by Republicans on Democrats. It really went back in the spotlight after the debate. Um, we looked at whether people thought that those claims about dogs and cats being eaten in Springfield, Ohio, were true. And by and large, the voting public says no. They don't think those claims are true. As you know, they've been debunked. Um, but 
for Donald Trump's voters, there are two thirds who do think that that is true, that his claims are true, that do approve of him making those claims. Now, here's the difference. For them, for the Donald Trump voters, we ask, well, why do you think he made those claims? And their answer was, they think he was trying to raise larger topics, raise larger issues about immigration. And that's something we've seen before with Trump's rhetoric. They may, there's maybe the literal part of it, but then there's also what they think is speaking to larger issues of concern to them. But juxtapose that against what the wider audience of voters thought. They disapproved of him making the claims. They thought his intent was to make people who were recent immigrants feel uncomfortable in those communities. And so that's the difference because, and sort of button up with this, when you look at Donald Trump's voters, remember that not only is immigration a big concern for them, but their perception of immigrants is very negative, frankly. It is they think immigrants commit more crimes. So that's been kind of underpinning a lot of that, and it speaks to that Trump voting base. Which is why he revisits that theme um, for throughout. One of the other things that I know all of us have been tracking, you've been really trying to quantify, is the risk of political violence and the support for it in this country. Uh, it was just last Sunday, there was this second attempt on Donald Trump's life. Now, what do you think that indicates, if anything, about the months ahead? Well, people think that the tone and tenor of our politics has gotten worse. And there is a substantial part of the electorate that does worry about political violence. And each side looks sort of across and says that they think violence might increase if the other side wins. And what's interesting about that is a lot of times people talk about the worry if one side or the other loses, but you also see this public conception of it as would that give kind of license to the other side if they were to come into power, all of which is to say, we do unfortunately see the public mind, the electorate feeling like this is a cloud hanging over the election. A concerning one. Anthony Salvanto, thank you. Thank you. And we turn now to Florida Senator Marco Rubio, the vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and he joins us from Miami. Good morning to you, Senator. Good morning. So I have a lot to get to with you, but I want to focus in on what you and your committee have been told. I know U.S. intelligence and the FBI said foreign actors are increasing their election interference as we get closer to November. This week, the Senate is going to be briefed in full on this. What is the scenario that is concerning to you? Well, I think it's going to become a fact of life in the 21st century. It's just very easy now for anyone to do it. You don't have to be a big nation state. So uh, they're kind of all different. The, the, the Russians are looking at what are the pre-existing fractures in our country, and then they try to sow division, getting us to fight with one another. That's primarily what we've seen them focused on, you know, sowing messages out there, uh, including with inauthentic things that they create. You know, you use AI, you make a fake video, whatever, you put it out there just to get Americans to fight against each other. In the case of uh, Iran, Iran has, uh, it seems to be more specifically focused on Donald Trump. I mean, it's been now publicly documented they're trying to kill him. And so if Iran's trying to kill Donald Trump, they most certainly don't want him to win the election. And um, so that's what their efforts have been, including uh, attempted hack and leak operations and things of this nature. The, the Chinese are, are really kind of new into this business or growing into this business of it. And they seem increasingly, in some, at least in past cases that we've seen publicly disclosed, going after specific candidates that they view as being anti-China. I don't think they want Donald Trump to win, but I, I do think you've seen them focus on things like congressional races in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and I also think they're laying the groundwork for more expansive operations in the future on influencing American public opinion on things like Taiwan and what's right. happening in the South China Sea and things of that nature. So there are multiple actors out there that are in the space now, and I think you'll see more in the years to come, because you don't really need, you know, to build uh, anything really expensive. You just mm -hmm. need access to the World Wide Web. And, you know, we're an open country, an open society with open means of communication. And the best way to deal with all this is for awareness. People right. to understand everything you see on the Internet isn't true. Right, exactly. That's why we want to talk about it. Um, Microsoft's president testified before your committee, and as he put it, the most perilous time is the 48 hours right before the election. He described this as a race between not just Trump and Harris, but Iran versus Trump and Russia versus Harris. Do you think the United States has gotten smarter in how it responds 
and, and have we learned from what happened in 2016? Yeah, and so what he alluded to are some instances in the past where some fake audio or fake video generated using AI is put out there and it influences the election 48 hours. I think we're a little bit insulated from that, not that we should let our guard down, but a lot of the votes are already in by the time 48 hours comes around. So that doesn't mean it's irrelevant in very close races. It could tip the scales. I do think all the way around, here's the bottom line. If you see something out there, a video that just seems way too scandalous, uh, I would pause for a second and make sure that it can be verified. Th that's my advice to everybody is mm -hmm. don't just believe something you see for the first time. It may have been something that happened five years ago and they're making it look like it happened yesterday. It may be something that uh, that has been made up uh, right. using an AI uh, mechanism to do so. And uh, and so th that would be my advice to people as well. Again, I'm not saying 48 hours before the election is irrelevant in America. Mm -hmm. I am saying it's probably less impactful than it is in some of these other countries who don't have mail voting, early voting, where so many of the votes are already in by then. Well, the, the Biden administration has issued sanctions, warnings, these public disclosures. One of them this week was about Iran trying to hurt the Trump campaign by hacking and stealing information and then sending it to the Biden campaign. This was similar to that hack and leak operation disclosed uh, in terms of trying to target journalists. And I know it was widely reported information about you, sir, was stolen and given to journalists. Do you know what was stolen? No, but I doubt it's anything that you probably couldn't find with uh, you know, just a search online of past stories that have been written and things of that nature. But I, look, I think you're going to seek more of that in the years to come. And I don't think that the, you know, to credit to the media outlets and so forth, I remind everybody that didn't run with it. I remind everybody, you know, back in 2016 when this first happened, um, you know, I said that's a foreign operation uh, that was used targeting the Clinton campaign. So this is going to become one of those things that is, I'm not saying we should be happy about it or accepting of it, but we need to be just understanding that this is now going to become a regular feature, not just of presidential races. You know, presidential yeah. races get so much attention that I think you can wade through some of that. It benefits from that, at least. But I think some of these lower ballot races are the ones that are particularly more susceptible, because if you're running for Congress or Senate somewhere, let's say a congressional seat, and someone dumps something like this on you, uh, it's much harder uh, to get the truth out there in time uh, for it to be cleared up. There just isn't going to be as much interest, and there isn't going to be as much people covering it. Well, uh, Donald Trump posted um, about the hack and leak operation attributed to Iran, but he said it was evidence that the FBI was spying on him and then blamed the vice president for spying on him. That is not at yeah, all I the case. I, no, I, well, again, I don't know anything more than what's been publicly reported when it comes to that hack and leak operation. Perhaps we'll know more this week. I, uh, but again, it doesn't surprise me that someone, you know, clicked on something, they got into your system, they stole documents, and then they try to give it to the media. And look, here, here's what we're going to see one day. It's not just that they're going to take it and give it to a campaign or the media. They're going to give it to somebody, some online journalist, somebody who will run with this right. stuff and will begin to report on it or maybe even alter it. For example, make up a fake email where it looks like a real email. Maybe it is a real email, but they alter a few words in it and put it out there. And by the time you put out that fire, um, it, it, you know, it's done damage. In a right. presidential race, everybody will cover that, and I think you can get to the truth a lot faster. In a down-ballot race, it's going to be a lot harder for some candidate to prove that that email is fake. By the time they do, the yes. election may be over. Just to be clear, though, it was the FBI that publicly disclosed this with the Intelligence Committee as happening, not the FBI right. spying That's on correct. the Trump campaign. Um, there are, when we want to talk about threats to Mr. Trump, it was just last Sunday, there was a second uh, near miss. There are FBI investigations underway into what happened here. Um, but Senator Vance said he doesn't trust Kamala Harris's Department of Justice to really investigate this stuff. Can you assure the American people that law enforcement is conducting a full and impartial investigation? Well, I think people on the ground in law enforcement want to do so. What information is made available to the American public, which deserves to know what is behind each one, not just one, but two assassination attempts of Donald Trump. I think that's where this lack of trust in institutions. Look, multiple people in the Federal Bureau of Investigation faced charges or were fired for misconduct in the way they handled issues about Donald Trump just eight years ago. So I think people are rightful to be suspicious and distrusting. And that's why it's so damaging, for example, when 51 former intelligence officials, formers, sign a letter saying that a laptop of Hunter Biden is Russian disinformation, then it turns out not to be true. And then people logically conclude, well, this is an example of how these agencies and our institutions work against candidates they don't like. It undermines people's trust 
in our institutions. And that lack of trust is eroded in government, in the media, yes. in, in, in our agencies within government. And unfortunately, that's why people, that's why disclosure and openness with regards to these investigations is so critical. It's not just because we want to know, it's right. because it's important to preserve trust in our institutions. And we're but not you, seeing that. More on the second than the first, but, we, but, you know, but we're not seeing it. But you trust the FBI and can assure the public that they are investigating these assassination attempts that J.D. Vance says they're not taking seriously? I trust rank and file in the field FBI agents to do their job. Okay. I don't know what their leadership in some of these agencies and the mid-level will do with it because you've seen a history in the past of there being bias. I hope that's not true. Yeah. And, and here, more importantly, I don't, I don't, I think what the real question is, if in fact they do discover, let's just say, I'm speculating, I'm not saying I know this to be true or even that I think is true, but let's say there is a foreign nexus to one of these two attempts, would they allow that information to be put out there to the American public before the election in November? I can't tell you with 100% certainty that there wouldn't be uh, those within the agency. Yes, absolutely. I think that's okay. an important factor for people to know. Um, th I wanted to ask you about whether you have heard or have any information in regard to a foreign nexus in regard to the bomb threats made in Springfield, Ohio. The governor of Ohio said they had over 30, and he said the person who made the calls came from overseas. This was after Trump and Vance put the focus on Haitian migrants in that town. Yeah, only what's been reported publicly, but that would not be uncommon. For example, a lot of these, uh, uh, these calls where they call and tell the SWAT team to go to someone's house because there's a murder occurring, a lot of these come from overseas as well. And unfortunately, there are, you know, that, that, that doesn't mean it's being directed by a government overseas. It okay. could be. I haven't heard that. But just because they're coming from overseas doesn't mean a government is behind it. But yeah, we have these kinds of individuals all over the world that yeah. like to do these kinds of things. Well, uh, here in this country, in terms of people being inspired to take action. Uh, we have been looking, as you heard, about um, what the perception of the public is right now, particularly with some of the things that Mr. Trump and Mr. Vance say. Our poll shows two-thirds of Trump supporters believe those false and disparaging claims about Haitian migrants are true. Uh, the governor of Ohio has said he is a big supporter of the ticket, but he's sad about this because there's no evidence of these claims. He's disparaging migrants who are legal, and the verbal attacks dilute and cloud what should be a winning argument for Republicans about the border. Do you agree that well, this kind I, of thing is a distraction from the broader point well, and dangerous? Well, it shouldn't be a distraction, because at a minimum, it shouldn't keep us from, for example, saying, OK, well, maybe I don't believe the dogs and the cats thing, but there are literally people moving in by the, by the thousands in the yes. case of Springfield, Charleroi in Pennsylvania. You know, that's a 4,000 person city that has 2,500 migrants. And I think one of the problems here is that somehow Americans who are not intolerant, they're not bigots, they're not, but they are troubled by the fact that their city is being flooded. In Springfield, you see reports, these are legitimate reports of huge increases in traffic accidents leading to yes. you know, slower police response time, overcrowded schools. I mean, the strain this puts out on a community. And if you complain about it, somehow you're a bigot, you're a racist, you're a hater. No, that we've is talked the story about here that legitimate... everyday Americans are being made to feel like they're haters because they're complaining about something all any of us would complain. If any of us, I don't care who we are, live in a city of 4,000 yeah. people and you bring in 2,500 migrants overnight into one place, there are going to be problems. And people there are, are going to complain problems. that doesn't make you a bigot. There are absolutely and that should, problems that, that should be what we're focused on. That the on. governor has documented and that we have talked about here. But it wasn't everyday people making those claims. It was the Republican nominee and his vice president making those false claims about Haitian migrants. Well, those, migrants. Are, claims, that no, those are claims that people... Those are claims that people in those communities made. Maybe some have now recanted or moved aside from it. But that should not take us away from the fundamental truth. And that is, there, is ha there are th real impacts happening when you move people into communities, as has been done by design by the Biden administration yes, but, and allowing people to cross the border. But you know, you're, you're in leadership. So you know, words matter. Yeah, right. and I think one of the words that should matter the most is there is a real migratory crisis. There is a real migratory crisis. And even in this particular case, not just Springfield, Charleroi, other places like that. People are, there are real impacts happening in our country with this movement of mass migration, and that's not gotten the coverage that it deserves. And you say you've covered it, other cover, but it hasn't gotten the coverage. The cats and dogs thing has gotten way more coverage than the right. real world impacts that this is having. And I think that's what needs to change in the way this issue is covered. Mm -hmm. We will talk about that more on this program, sir. We've got to leave it there for today. Senator Marco Rubio, thank you for joining us. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you. We go now to Democratic Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan of Pennsylvania. She joins us from New York this morning. 
Uh, good morning, Congresswoman. I know you are one of the lawmakers looking into this near miss uh, in terms of the attempt on the life of Donald Trump recently and the incident back in July. Did you get the answers you needed from Secret Service this past week? And first of all, thank you for having me. And yes, I'm one of uh, 13 members, seven R's, uh, six D's that are looking into this uh, particular re event on July, but also the most recent one as well. Um, yes, we have been getting the answers that we've been asking for. We have been asking for quite a lot out of both uh, the Secret Service as well as local law enforcement. And I believe that the answers have been largely forthcoming, if for whatever reason they're not. The good thing about this particular group is that we have subpoena authority to be able to make sure that we get the answers. It's really important that this group works bipartisanly and quickly to be able to understand what happened, to be able to make sure that it doesn't happen again, and to your conversation with Senator Rubio to make sure that we restore the faith and trust in the, uh, with the American people in the institutions such as law enforcement and the Congress. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Congresswoman, I know the Secret Service on Friday publicly admitted some of the failures on their own part. Uh, it was a five-page summary, but the Secret Service said agents failed to use technology to d detect the attacker back in July as he flew a drone over the rally. Trump's detail had no idea police were looking for a suspicious person until shots were fired, and they never directed local police to cover a nearby rooftop. Do you trust the current leadership to address very serious issues like this. These are very, very serious issues, and they have come up in our conversations and in uh, the briefings that we've received. And there were some enormous gaps that you've mentioned in terms of people texting information to each other rather than using the radio, in terms of people not even knowing that there were two command centers. There were huge gaps. And there were also some gaps, frankly, in kind of culture uh, and people being relatively lax in the way that they communicated with one another. And all of these things have to be fixed. Um, I, I do believe that the attention of the organization is fully on uh, all of the different things that they can and should be doing to be correct to correct themselves. I think also the attention of the Congress is on them as well to make sure they have the resources to be able to make those corrections as, too. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk to you more about some of those solutions on the other side of this commercial break. If you could stay with us, Congresswoman, so we could finish our conversation. And we'll be right back with more from Congresswoman Houlihan. Stay with us. CBS News will host the first and likely only vice presidential debate between Senator J.D. Vance and Governor Tim Walz on Tuesday, October 1st. Join the CBS News political team for live coverage of the debate. The debate itself will be moderated by CBS Evening News anchor Nora O'Donnell and myself right here on CBS, CBS News 24-7 and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We are continuing our conversation with Pennsylvania Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan. Um, Congresswoman, just to button up this conversation about the Secret Service and political violence right now, um, our latest CBS poll shows Harris supporters think the nation will see a higher threat of violence if Donald Trump is elected, and Trump backers think the nation will see higher threats if Vice President Kamala Harris is elected. Do you have any concern about rhetoric and with Democrats characterizing Donald Trump as a threat to democracy? Do you think that can be used to justify or inadvertently even encourage violence? Sure, and let's start from the beginning. Uh, political violence of any form is unacceptable and we will not tolerate it. And the Democratic Party, starting from the very top, from President Biden to Vice President Harris to members of Congress such as myself, have decried political violence, full stop. Um, and it is one of those things where we really do need to dial down the temperature and the vitriol. And I think that it's important that everybody do that. And as you mentioned in your earlier segment, it starts at the top, leadership matters. And so both sides of the aisle need to make sure that we're being thoughtful about these conversations that we're having. But important to you to, about me to know is you and I would likely not be talking had there not been the first election of President Trump. And many of the ways that he conducts himself um, really need to make sure that, that we understand that should he return to the White House, 
I am personally concerned that that would be a problem for our democracy. But that means that I'm working hard to make sure that I get out the vote and have the conversations to make sure that Kamala Harris is successful in her efforts to go to the White House. Mm -hmm. And you said that in this bipartisan investigation, you, that is a focus for you to make sure that you have Republicans and Democrats delivering the same message. Um, and I take your point Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And, and exactly. We were chosen because we're serious uh, lawmakers. We were chosen because we tend to be those people who are willing to do the work and to do it uh, quietly and effectively and to do it bipartisanly. And that's what I intend to do. Um, you are as we said, a representative from Pennsylvania and the Commonwealth is a key battleground. Our CBS polling shows it is just dead heat there. But yesterday, Senator J.D. Vance was campaigning in Pennsylvania and he said they feel extremely good about their prospects there. Do you have that kind of confidence? I, ha I have the uh, opposite feeling, which is, as I mentioned, I, I would not be talking to you had uh, Hillary Clinton been successful uh, years ago. And we had confidence as Democrats that evening that Pennsylvania would be blue. And as we all know, that wasn't the case. So I will let Mr. Vance have his confidence because I'm gonna keep working all the way into the end of the election and through the finish line and through the tape because I really believe it's that important that we take nothing for granted and that we work as hard as we can during this next several uh, weeks, I guess, six weeks now. Six weeks. And, uh, you know, on that debate stage, I heard Vice President Harris very specifically speak to the 500,000 Polish Americans she said live in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And she drew that directly to her position on Ukraine and the war there. I know you are leading outreach to Polish Americans. How do you quantify how that war, thousands of miles away from the United States, impacts how voters in the state of Pennsylvania actually think about it. Do you really think that it has an influence on the vote? I do, and I can draw a straight line to it. My father was born in Poland. He was born in 1942 into a Jewish family. He and his mother survived the Holocaust. I'm here I'm here in America because he was able to survive and came here and had a, a thriving naval career. Um, and now I'm a member of Congress one generation later. That is because of the, the constant war that goes over that part of our, of our world, uh, starting back in the Huns. Um, and I think it's really important that we talk to the Polish American population as well as everybody from the kind of Eastern Europe area, because it's not that long ago that World War II was. And that is absolutely something that can repeat itself if we don't support the Ukrainians and we don't support their fight for their democracy, which is their fight for all of our democracies. Uh, also importantly, as a Pennsylvanian, the Lithuanian National Guard is our partner country. And so our men and women are in Lithuania at this moment uh, within harm's way if we don't help Ukraine. So I do think it's absolutely uh, an issue that makes sense and that we should talk about in places like Pennsylvania. Okay. And my producer is telling me it's actually higher than half a million. It's 800,000. Polish American. It is 800,000. <laughs> I <Wow>. didn't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. It's Thank a good you. number. Yeah. It, it, it certainly seems like that. And, and the president of Poland visiting uh, the Commonwealth today as well. We'll watch and see how that impacts what your voters think. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for joining us this morning. We'll be right back. We go now to Colorado Democratic Governor Jared Polis, who joins us this morning from Boulder, Colorado. Governor, uh, welcome back to Face the Nation. Uh, I know you are supporting- Pleasure to be here. Uh, supporting the vice president's bid for the presidency. She is ahead by four points, as you heard in our latest poll, but this is very tight. What is your greatest area of concern of potential vulnerability here? Well, yeah, it's 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 neck and neck. And, you know, I was I was reflecting this morning, you know, the next president we elect is going to be president during our 250th anniversary as a nation, our semi quincentennial a term we're going to be hearing more of. We know that Donald Trump's not the person that can unite us and bring us together in that exciting time to celebrate our nation's past, present and future. Let's give Kamala uh, Harris the opportunity to show that she is. I really feel that she's ready to unite us. It's neck and neck. And we just need to get the vote out in the states that matter to be able to make sure that we can move forward rather than backward as a country. I want to ask you about some of her economic plans, but first about immigration. You heard Senator Rubio on this program talk about the lack of attention being paid to 
immigration and the border crisis, but I know you, Governor, have been dealing with it firsthand. Um, in Aurora, Colorado, that's been getting a lot of attention from the Trump team in particular because of members of a Venezuelan prison gang who migrated here to the U.S. and apparently were involved in a shooting in Aurora. During the debate, Donald Trump used Aurora as an example of the worst of the migrant crisis. This is what he said yesterday. Under Border Czar Harris, Venezuelan gangs have taken over entire apartment buildings in Aurora, Colorado. The, government, the governor is petrified in Colorado. He's a liberal governor. He doesn't know what to do. The guy is so scared of these guys, and maybe you can't blame him. Governor, I know local officials set up a special task force, but how do you respond to this personal attack here? Well, I, I, you know, I went shopping in Aurora yesterday. I, I, what a lot of Americans need to know is Aurora is a over 400,000 people. It's Colorado's uh, third largest city. Violent crime is down two years in a row. Car thefts are down two years in a row. It's, it's a wonderful city. I'm there all the time. Uh, it's, it's really a great, diverse city, and it's growing fast. It'll probably be the number one or number two city in Colorado over the next decade or two. So uh, it's a great city. It's safer than it's, than it's been. And uh, look, it's like any city, Chicago, L.A., mid-sized cities, Denver. Of course, there's been an issue with gangs for decades uh, in Aurora, and I feel that we finally turned the corner. I mean, this is the difference between electing a president that skirts the law versus one who's made a career enforcing the law. I mean, Kamala Harris is somebody who's who stared criminal enterprises in the face, put criminals behind bars mm -hmm. as district attorney, and she's going to take that same attitude to the White House to make America safer. But the mayor of Aurora has, has acknowledged a special task force was established and, and said they're working with the federal government. It's a regional issue. Should, should the Harris campaign be talking about some of these real issues and acknowledging them in a way that might help their campaign? Because really, the answer is about that failed border bill at the, in Congress. That's usually what the Harris campaign talks about. Should they acknowledge more of these real issues? Well, I, first of all, I think that's a legitimate and important issue to talk about. Uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, Democratic and Republican leaders in Congress, had a real bill, bill before them to make the needed investments in border security. Look, I've, I've been down to the border. I've, I've, I've been at border crossings. Uh, we need better border security. Kamala Harris will deliver on that because it's not a simple proposition. It requires investment, high-tech investment, fencing, uh, scanning, uh, more more border patrol agents, which the bill would have funded uh, more border patrol agents. So, look, I I'm confident that Kamala Harris is somebody that will actually solve the border issue rather than keep it going for purely political yeah. reasons and for dividing us. We need somebody who's going to unite us. And, of course, that includes securing our border. Should she talk about it more? Well, I, look, I mean, I think she talks about it as, as one of the issues. I mean, it's we need to make America safer. We need to secure the border. She had a plan to do that. It was blocked by Donald Trump and Republicans. Mm -hmm. So, look, I think it's a great issue for people to, to run on and talk about. And it's one that Democrats should have a huge advantage on because Republicans have failed time and time again to secure our border. Uh, I want to ask about the economic plans here. Vice President Harris has a proposal to tackle housing affordability. And she wants to give a first-time homebuyer's down payment credit of $25,000 in addition to a $10,000 tax credit. I know you see this firsthand, what the crisis looks like in Colorado. Are you concerned that this will fuel demand for homes and just push up prices rather than solving the supply issue? So that's not the whole plan, right? That's one plank of the plan. Her plan is focused on creating over 3 million new homes, reducing bureaucracy and red tape, making it easier to build homes people can afford. Yes, as part of that, we want people, when they can, to be owners instead of renters so they can build value. This is the opportunity economy she talks about, right? Renting a home, a place to live, it's important. Owning a home, building equity and wealth over time, that's what Kamala Harris believes in. So, of course, 3 million new homes, reducing bureaucracy and paperwork, making it easier to build as part of that. Helping transform renters into owners is a key thing we should do to help make America more successful. So that's how you would choose to solve it in your state as well. You think this would fix the problem? 
Well, again, you, yeah, you, you talked about one plank. We're engaged in very similar reforms here. We've allowed now people to build accessory dwelling units, mother-in-law flats by right. We're doing additional allowing for multifamily, more inherently affordable housing near transit. The hardest kind of homes to build, not just in Colorado, but this goes in most communities across the country, have been those two, three hundred thousand dollar starter homes that somebody early in their career might be able to make the down payment and afford. Uh, the average home price in the Denver metro area is now six hundred thousand dollars. And that's great for those who can afford it, but we need more homes that are available for purchase in that two to three hundred thousand dollar range. That's what we're focused on in Colorado. We need the help nationally. Whoever saw, you know, we, this takes mayors, governors, presidents, all working in the same direction towards making housing more affordable, and that's exactly what Kamala Harris's plan will do. Governor, thank you for your time this morning. We'll be back in a moment. Hezbollah responded to Israel's strikes by firing over 100 rockets deep into Israel overnight. CBS News foreign correspondent Chris Livesay has the latest from Tel Aviv. A barrage of Hezbollah rockets and drones pierced the stillness of northern Israel this morning. Israel says most were intercepted by the Iron Dome defenses, but some found their target like this strike near Haifa, which left three wounded and one dead when a teenager lost control of his vehicle. All of it in response to this. An Israeli attack on Friday in southern Beirut that killed top Hezbollah commander Ibrahim Akil, who will be buried later today following the funerals of other commanders who died in the strike. The Akil strike came after two days of devastating attacks on thousands of Hezbollah militants. The Israeli military says the war's center of gravity is now moving north towards Hezbollah and away from Hamas. But Israel hasn't forgotten about Gaza. Today, a school where hundreds were sheltering was struck west of Gaza City. This just a day after the Hamas-run health ministry said a strike on another shelter-turned-school left more than 20 people dead, half of them children, one of them a pregnant woman. Israel said the school had been turned into a Hamas command center. In a separate instance, our CBS News team in Gaza filmed babies and children injured in a strike on their family home this morning. In our Al Jazeera office in occupied West Bank, has just been raided. And in the West Bank, during a live broadcast, Israeli forces shut down the Ramallah Bureau of Broadcaster Al Jazeera. As a journalist read the warrant, the Qatar-based network is accused of inciting and supporting terrorism. Well, so far, Israel has not claimed responsibility for those exploding beepers and walkie-talkies, Margaret. But today, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu did say that Israel dealt Hezbollah, quote, a sequence of blows it could not imagine. That was our Chris Livesay from Tel Aviv. We turn now to the president of Israel, Isaac Herzog. Welcome back to Face the Nation. Thank you, Margaret. Good morning. Mr. President, in the, in the past few days, Israel carried out a, a groundbreaking operation against thousands of Hezbollah fighters in Lebanon. The U.S. was only given 20 minutes notice ahead of time. Since then, Israel also carried out a strike in Beirut that killed senior commanders of Hezbollah. What is the strategy here, and is Israel trying to escalate into a full-blown war with Hezbollah? Absolutely not. We did not want this war. We're not seeking war. This war was waged upon us by the proxies of the empire of evil of Iran on October 7th by Hamas and on October 8th by Hezbollah and ever since from Lebanon in the north and of course from Hamas in the south and all over the Middle East. The proxies of Iran are attacking and attacking. Now, Hezbollah has been attacking us on a daily basis, dem demolishing Israeli villages and towns, um, basically leading to the eviction of 100,000 Israelis from their homes. Life has been shattered in our northern border. I don't think any American would have accepted it as a, as a kind of a status quo situation in the United States. And at the end, there are things that must be done. The duty of a government or a nation is to take care of its citizens and bring them back home. But on the issue of uh, what's happening 
in the north of Israel right now. The White House argues that a war in Lebanon is not the way to bring those 100,000 Israelis back into their homes. Uh, they want a diplomatic agreement about that blue line. Do you think that the current government of Israel wants a diplomatic agreement? We uh, never said uh, that we don't want a diplomatic agreement. On the contrary, there is a very able American envoy, Amos Hochstein, the president's advisor, who is trying to go uh, back and forth between us and the Lebanese. But truly, let's understand the situation. When you're dealing with terror organizations, they don't really give a damn about international affairs. They take hostages or they fire as much as they want. They get instructions from Tehran. They send Houthi terrorists to block the high seas and the cost of living in the world goes up. This is the culture of terror. Yeah. And it's a terror of jihadists, meaning they don't give a damn about anything. Now, we agree time and again to go into rounds of talks. We support and welcome the efforts by the United States of America and the administration. Truly, we respect it tremendously. But at the end of it, OK, Mr. Hochstein leaves Israel and they keep on firing and firing. And that cannot go on forever because our citizens must go back home. Because yes. the guy in, Le in Lebanon, Mr. Nasrallah, thinks he, that he wants to link it to Gaza. And in Gaza, there's another arch terrorist, Mr. Sinwar, in the mm -hmm. dungeons, who doesn't want to get to a deal, refuses to get to a deal. This is jihadism at its best, and that's what we are fighting. Well, and I wish, truly, and I say it as the president of Israel officially, yes. and I say it outright because I know we don't want war, but if it's waged against us, we go all the way. Well, you say you don't want war. Mr. President, Israel moved its 98th division to the north of Israel this week. Your defense minister says the center of gravity is moving towards Lebanon. What is the intention of those military moves, if not to prepare for war? Because these guys who we uh, eradicated on Friday were gathering together in, the, in their apartment in Beirut in order to plan Another October 7th, that, that they developed this school of thought of swarming into Israel, of trying to take hostage, of do, butchering, do raping, evidence? burning, abducting. Do you At have the end, we that have attack enough was imminent? Uh, risks here to take care of. Pardon? Do you have evidence that there was an imminent attack? So I can't go into all the information itself, but it is assumed that they were planning an attack. You see today, this morning, they took out a, a, a barrage of attacks on Israeli cities, towns, and villages all over the northern part of Israel, pounding with uh, huge bombs and missiles on the northern part of Israel. Why would any nation accept it? Why would any decent nation accept it? We're almost a year in such a situation of a kind of a vicious cycle. We want to get out of this vicious cycle. This past week, the AP put out graphic footage shot in the West Bank where Israeli soldiers pushed the bodies of Palestinians off the roof of buildings there. The White House says they want an investigation, that this is abhorrent and egregious behavior. How do you respond to these concerns from one of your closest allies that Israel may be adding to escalation risk? So we, of course, listen to our closest ally. Uh, openly and frankly, this is if, if it occurred as reported and it is under investigation because we are a nation of the rule of law, we will, of course, take all necessary action. We will condemn it and use all the, you know, the legal steps that need to be taken against it. But we are studying it because we are a serious army and a serious people and we study and investigate ourselves as much as we can. Before I let you go, do you think that President Biden's efforts to negotiate that hostage deal is just wishful thinking at this point? Will this be a problem for the next American president? So actually, uh, I would say that I have huge respect for President Biden's effort, and we support it whole day, wholeheartedly. But as uh, the spokesperson of the National Security Council, General Kirby, just said the other day, we are not getting any positive signs from Hamas at all, from Sinwar. He's out there in the dungeons 
taking, you know, a, I mean, whatever we think mm -hmm. in our line of thinking as free, loving nations and peoples, he thinks the other way. But I would say that the, actually the call for the family of nations in this current crisis, which is boiling hot, is actually perhaps the opportunity to go forward and change the situation by finding the right exit and bringing yeah. the hostages back home. Mr. President, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.